um, for the last talk of this uh, course. I'm going to talk about some more sort of, perhaps, well, in the end anyway, some more recent work on smectic thin, thin films. So what you see here is, uh, um, well, there's, a, there's it's it's um, HCB, which is which is a particular liquid crystal, and it's poured onto a onto a surface. And what what you see, so it's it's just just a very thin film. So it's extremely. So I'm, for example, in this representation here, it's two hundred and seventy nanometers. So very thin. So it's poured onto the surface. And what you see is uh, looking down from on top, you see these, um, so these are experiments of the group of Emmanuel Lacars in Paris. And uh, you see these, well, what they call oily stripes, or oily streaks, oily streaks. Uh, so lots of parallel streaks and then another family here and they sort of meet on something. Now when you look at one of these um, um, streaks from from the side, all right, so now this is the bottom of the, of the, uh, this is the substrate. So uh, the, the liquid crystal is poured onto different kinds of surfaces, mica for example, or, or, or molybdenum sulfide, or, or rubbed PVA. And um, and so uh, so for example, from here to here, this is just a representation. I'll try and explain a bit more. But from here to here would be one of these, one of the, the cross section of one of these layers, right? So th this is a photograph, of course. But but uh, but these are these are sort of representations. It's it's really tricky to really tricky to uh, find out exactly what's happening to the layers. And it's done by all sorts of different techniques. And it's not sort of 100% sure that the, well, the, the, this, this was an older representation. This is a, a more modern one. But I was at the International Liquid Crystal Conference in, in, in Lisbon earlier this year. And even this picture was being uh, slightly modified. Okay, so it doesn't quite come down so sharply here. but is smoother and it's got some sort of defect there. So it, it, it's a very complicated situation. I don't know whether you can actually see. Um, the, here the layers are horizontal. At the bottom there, they're vertical. And here they're sort of curved, right? Now, the, the thing is that, that on the, so th this is smectic A. So if you remember, the, the molecules are perpendicular to the layers. And the boundary condition on the top is, uh, is it where it's in contact with air is homeotropic. In other words, it's, 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 it's the, the, the director uh, is, is parallel to the normal, okay, which, which is the same as the layers being uh, uh, like this. On the bottom, however, um, the, um, it, it's treated so that uh, the director wants to be horizontal. Um, I think it's, it's, it can be horizontal in, in any direction. So you see you've got a very thin film and you've got antagonistic boundary conditions. Here the, 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 the director wants to be perpendicular and here it needs to be horizontal. Okay? And what you, what you see here is the result of, of um, it, you know, what it does to try and sort that out. OK, so uh, remember that this is smectic A, uh, where the molecules are perpendicular to the layers, and the smectic C, which we won't treat, so they make a certain angle. So in, in, those, in those experiments, uh, you apparently see uh, surfaces of discontinuity of the layer normals. Okay? And so they correspond to um, wall defects across which the director jumps. Okay? And that's not something that's considered in the, in the way we treated the ozone Frank theory, for example. We don't, we don't l allow the director to jump, right? So the question is, how, how can these, these be modeled? So let's leave the discussion to smectics smect to a bit later. But a possible model, which was proposed by uh, my student Stephen Bedford in well, 
not in 201, it was 2015, actually, uh, is, to, is to consider a free energy functional like this, which I, I, I sort of mentioned earlier in, in the course. So you, you take the usual um, ozane frank energy, uh, but now, now you let n be in SPV. I'll just remind you in the next slide about SPV, but, but anyway, n is allowed to jump in, 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 um, in SPV, and this is, this is the set on which it jumps, and these are the, uh, the, uh, the um, directions on either side, and this is the normal to the, to the, to the jump set. Uh, and this gradient of n is, 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 the, um, is the absolutely continuous part of the distributional derivative. And so the, the SPV of omega with values in S2 is the set of things in SPV with values in R3, which are, which are of uh, norm 1 uh, almost everywhere. OK, so now just a little bit to remind about special functions of boundary variation, which is incredibly technical if you haven't actually uh, looked at it yourself. So this is the definition. Um, space SPV is a set of maps U, which are in L1 with values in, in, in Rm, whose distributional derivative is a measure which has no counterpart. Okay. And the key points are this. So, um, so first of all, for any U, there's this jump set, which is a finite uh, n minus 1 dimensional Hausdorff measure. Okay, so in, if n was 3, it can be, it can be some surface. Um, and, and, it, and it consists of the points in, in omega at which u has a jump discontinuity, which of course has to be defined sort of precisely and so on. And then for almost all with respect to two dimensional uh, n, n, n minus one dimensional measure on the on the surface, there's a well-defined normal nu nu of x and well-defined limits u plus x and u minus x uh, from either side. And the absolutely continuous part is defined well, it's defined almost everywhere, but in particular, it's defined almost everywhere outside the <coughs> outside the jump set. Okay, and um, we'll, we'll have occasion to use um, uh, SBV2, omega and R, and that's the things in SBV whose gradient is in L2, who the absolutely continuous part of the gradient is in, is in L2. Okay, so now, so let's go back now to the, we have this, we have this F, right? So the question is, what properties should this F satisfy? So properties of F, so um, uh, we want it to be defined on, uh, on unit vectors cross unit vectors cross unit vectors, because two values of n are normal. Uh, we'll make it be non-negative, continuous frame indifference. So if I pre-multiply by rotations R, it doesn't, doesn't change F. And also we'd like it to uh, be invariant to reversing the signs of n plus and n minus. So that's the usual thing about head to tail symmetry of the molecules. And so that we have this, uh, this uh, set of uh, conditions. And we'd also like that um, Fnn nu is zero. So if there's no jump, you don't have any, any uh, energy, right? But sometimes, well, when it's easier mathematically, one can consider the case where the minimum, <coughs> where, when F is one, for example. But it's, uh, that's not really realistic. OK, and so here's the answer. A necessary and sufficient condition uh, that a continuous F satisfies uh, 1 and 2 is, is, this, is this, that F depends on these things, the squares or the dot products of the, of the vectors, and then also the, the, the product of all the dot products. Okay. Um, and, uh, and you can you can say exactly what this, what the domain of this uh, uh, function is. Okay. Now, order reconstruction. So this is a, a sort of simpler situation where you see these antagonistic boundary conditions for a thin film. So, uh, so now we'll, we'll have, um, we'll have a, um, a region omega delta, which has thickness delta in the x3 direction. And um, 
uh, on the bottom plate, we'll, we'll suppose it's treated so that the director is parallel to the E1 direction, and on the top plate, that it's vertical. Okay, it's parallel to E3. Okay, and so now we'll, uh, so that we see that delta is going to be very small, and so uh, it's got to somehow get from here to here. How's it going to do it? So let, let's first of all uh, use the landau Gen theory. So the, the boundary conditions are going to be that uh, on, on a, well, first of all, we'll, we'll um, this, I should say this domain, we'll, we'll, we'll say it's L1 in the one direction, L2 in the uh, two direction, and delta in the x3 direction. And so on the bottom, uh, we want uh, Q, Q to be uh, S1, E1 tensor E1 minus a third of the identity because uh, N wants to be plus or minus E1. S1 is a scalar order parameter which will take positive. And on the top, um, uh, Q1 is Q, Q1 is S2 E3 tensor E3 minus one third of the identity with a possibly different um, uh, order parameter. Okay, so those are the boundary conditions. And we'll take them to be, well, and periodic in x1 and x2. Okay. So, um, and we'll suppose, we'll take a slightly simplified situation. We'll take a, a bulk potential, either the cortic or the singular bulk potential. And we'll take a slightly simplified um, elastic energy, which just depends on the gradient of Q, so not the, not the term with L4. And quadratic and bounded below by a, a positive constant times the gradient of Q squared. And of course the natural thing to do is to rescale, so instead of working on a slab of thickness delta, you work on a slab of thickness one. So to do that, you so D is going to be the region now where the uh, rescale thing lives, and so, um, so we let P be uh, Q at x1, x2, delta x3, and then it turns out that the, the the I of Q is 1 over delta times this guy. All right, so morally, morally um, delta is 0 in this. Okay, so this goes away, and these two terms go away. So you've just got a function, a convex function of, of P comma 3, and it's going to have constant values at top and bottom, and so the answer is going to be linear. All right, so, so, that's, that's, that's a, so you can prove that. So that um, if p delta is a minimizer of e delta, then as delta goes to zero, p delta tends to p bar. Um, it's it's the third the, the derivative with respect to x three converges to p bar comma three. The other terms go to zero, and p bar is this linear thing that matches that takes you from q zero to q one. So this is sort of straightforward to check. So what it means is that for sufficiently small delta, Q is given approximately by this. I'm just now putting it back in the original variables. And now you can um, look and see what happens to the director. So the director is usually identified with the eigenvector of Q corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. Okay, so, so you find that, in fact, there's a, um, there's a point uh, midway, uh, well, if S1 was equal to S2, it would be exactly midway. Uh, so, uh, so, so at which the the um, the director, the eigenvalue corresponding to the largest, the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue, changes discontinuously from E1 to E3. So, on this plane, X3 is S1 over S1 plus S2 delta. You have a jump in the director. Okay. And these are molecular dynamics simulations, actually this is for 5C, 5CB, um, of a um, group of Claudio Zanoni again. Uh, now, um, on, on, on this picture you see the elements of the Q tensor. So the thickness, the bottom is here and the top, top is here. Right, so it's going to a hundred, I don't know, something angstroms or something. And uh, these are the, the these various things are the various components of um, 
um, uh, of, of Q. And here are the eigenvalues. Here are the eigenvalues of Q. And you see that there's a, indeed there's a, a crossover more or less near, near the middle. Um, so at about 0.61 nanometers with a jump in the with a jump in the director. So there's something very interesting uh, about this uh, picture. Um, so so Zanoni sent me this sent me the sent me the um, the values of the Q tensor, and so we calculated the the eigenvalues, right? But 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 then also he has he he had a picture another picture. In this in this paper of the um, of the graph of the largest eigenvalue, and it wasn't quite the same as this. It was it was a bit less. Okay, <laughs> and the re the reason is that it's, it's interesting, and, and and it sort of shows you how you'd have to be very careful if you did a, a kind of molecular to continuum theory, because okay, so the, these pictures are, are these are Monte Carlo simulations, right? So he he takes the he takes the um, the region and he divides it into lots of layers. I don't know, maybe ten layers or something like this, which have about say 150 molecules in each layer. So enough to get a statistical description. And of course, it's averaged over all many many runs. Okay. So what he what he did was to um, uh, well he, he averaged the, the the values of the Q tensor, and that's what's in that left hand picture. But he also ad averaged the the um, the values of the largest eigenvalue, whereas what I did was to take the eigenvalue of the average, right? And one is less than the one is less than the other by convexity, because the largest eigenvalue is a convex function of the matrix. So I thought that was kind of interesting um, thing to learn. Okay, so we could also uh, analyze this using a director model like we had before. So well, let's take a simplified situation where we just have the one constant theory. And here's, um, here's an energy that doesn't depend on the normal, but it does have the property that when n plus is equal to n minus, then it's 0. Right? So it's 1 minus n plus dot n minus squared to the r over 2. r is, uh, is between 0 and 1. And we take uh, L1 and L2 is equal to 1. Um, I'll, so, so I'll say a bit more in the, a bit later about how you handle the boundary conditions. You have to be a little bit careful when you're dealing with SPV because you can have a jump at the boundary. Okay, so there's, uh, it's sort of relatively standard if you know this technical stuff to, um, that there's at least one minimizer subject to the boundary conditions. And um, now, now a candidate for the minimum of i would be the bending solution of the of the uh, Ozen Frank theory. So, which you know, it starts off horizontal, and as you go up, it becomes vertical. So, there's an exact solution to the Ozen Frank theory that does it, and here it is. Okay, so you see it at x three equals zero. It's it's e one, and when x three is uh, one, it is e three. Okay. And uh, so you calculate you calculate what this uh, um, bending solution gives you, it gives you k pi squared over 2 delta. Um, all right. So, however, um, for delta sufficiently small, that's not the minimizer. And minimizers have the form that the E1 up to some tor and then E3, where tor can be actually, in this case, any, anywhere between 0 and delta. So it doesn't tell you where the where the jump is, and indeed you can calculate what the energy of this is. So there's no elastic, e there's no term from grad n squared, it's zero. The only energy you have is the interfacial energy. The area is one, and the, um, and so you, you, you it, and the, there's a constant in front times k, so it's, so, so it's k. And so uh, provided, uh, so you, you know, this will be less than the previous value, provided delta is less than that number. So you see that, uh, that that these wall defects are likely to happen on very small scales when you have uh, when you have uh, competing boundary conditions that are going to force it to do something like that.
Okay, so now let me talk about models of semantics. So this is a very sort of, well, I don't know, uh, muddled or muddled area. Um, so first of all, there are models um, which uh, apply to, to the situation when la the layers have constant thickness. And, and if they have constant thickness, that means that they're, they're, they're locally parallel. And so let's suppose that m of x is the normal to the layer through x. Okay? And if, if m is sufficiently smooth, then, then I claim that the curl of m is 0. So here's a sort of proof. Um, let's take x equals 0. And uh, m of 0 is e3. So the layer surface through x has the equation x3 is f of x1, x2. And the gradient of f at 0 is 0. So this is the sort of situation we have. And now for x on the surface, the normal uh, is given by this, minus f comma 1 minus f comma 2, 1 over the 1 plus root of grad f squared. So you calculate these derivatives. And you find that dm1 dx2 is dm2 dx1, which is minus f comma 1, 2, and that these two guys are 0. So that means that the curl of m, so the fact that these two are equal make the last one 0, and the curl of m at 0 is equal to this. Okay, but, but if, if the, the layers are locally parallel, that means, well, at, at, uh, at, at, at 0, 0, x3, it's, it's, uh, zero, zero, it's 0, 0, 1. So the, the derivatives with respect of m3 with respect to x1 and m3 with respect to x2 are 0. So you get that the curl is 0. Well, if the curl is 0, and you've got smectic A, that means that, the cur that N is M, so the curl of N is 0. Okay. So that if we ignore the, um, the saddle splay term, or, or put K24 equals 0, whichever you want to say, so all the terms involving curl N vanish, and the only term you've got left is div N squared. And, and, and that's equal to gradient of N squared under the, under the hypotheses that but, um, well, I shouldn't have them a little bit of a lie, actually. It's, um, th that's true, provided the saddle splay term is 0. Yeah. Um, OK, and then you have to minimize this subject to curl n is 0 and n is a unit vector. So that was proposed by Ozane in 1933 in the Orsay group, group of Degen. Now, if, if omega is simply connected, then n will be the gradient of phi, and therefore you've got to minimize a half k1 times the, the Laplacian of phi squared subject to the iconal equation, the, the absolute value of gradient of phi is 1. So for example, if n minimizes um, the integral of gradient of n squared and n is gradient of phi, then phi is a minimizer, right? So for example, a hedgehog would be a, a, possible, a possible minimizer. OK, so now here's something that's always mentioned in, in, in Moxana, and, and, and they say that it has something to do with the li liquid crystals, the Avila's Giga function. Uh, so you look at the derivation of this in, in, in their paper. It says the following. This is verbatim, including the misprints. Simple examples and physical considerations. Ericsson 17 and Seth 18 suggest that the solution of the following relaxation problem explain with accuracy the phenomena. So, and you look at the, what these references are, and it just says private communications. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know of a derivation of, <laughs> of this. Okay. Okay, so now a more general model, uh, which would be to minimize an energy of the form I of n and m, and and gradient of n and gradient of m. And that was um, proposed by Stuart Leslie and uh, Nakagawa. And they impose the constraint m dot n is cos theta. Theta is a constant. Okay, So if theta was uh, 0, that would be smectic a. Otherwise, it would be smectic c. Or you could, you could relax it. And, uh, and, um, so these, these are, these are um, models um, depending on, on the on the director. Um, but the, there are other things that happen. You see, the layers are not, are not necessarily always of constant thickness. They can also have dislocations, like here. right? Um, 
So what can we do for that? Well, th well they, they typically introduce a molecular number density as a new macroscopic variable, with the smectic layers being seen as density waves, sort of sinusoidal things going in this direction. And in the Dijen approach, and that of Chen Lubensky, it's assumed that this number density is some, some base number density plus rho of x, and, uh, and rho of x is, is some r of x times cos phi of x, okay? and, uh, and rho zero is a positive constant average density, and then, 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 um, then capital of C of x, which is R of x, e to the i phi of x, is used as a complex order parameter. And I, I always find it irritating when you have complex order parameters. You know, you have to think what, what that means exactly, right? Uh, but anyway, but anyway, the, a row of x de de describes the fluctuations in the density due to the smectic layers, and the gradient of phi gives the normals to the layers. Okay, so there's uh, various models of this type. So this is Clayman and Perodi. You have the ozone frank energy and then you have um, a tensor acting on, um, on which, 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 which depends on the normal uh, acting on n minus grad phi twice. And then Wayne on Ur and later Santangelo and Kemian argue that a good approximation to this is given by k1 div n squared plus a multiple of gradient, absolute value of gradient phi minus 1 all squared, together with the constraint that n is grad phi over norm of grad phi. Well, this one up here, you can imagine, is not so difficult to, say, prove existence of minimizers, right? Because, well, the the n is just this. I mean, the ozone frank is just the same as before. You, so you've got an, uh, you've got a, a term here, which, I mean, which which gives you a gradient phi squared and so on. And so it is sort of straightforward to get minimizers for this. On this one, however, that's not at all obvious uh, to me. I try spent some time trying to prove existence of minimizers that because you, there's this constraint. So danger is that gradient phi goes to zero in some minimizing sequence or something. So, so I don't know whether you can actually get existence of a minimizer there. OK, so now what about models using this, this density rather than the angle? Um, well, there's one from the Chinese, right? <laughs> Which is a systematic kind of um, derivation or expansion um, from a sort of molecular molecular theory like the uh, of the on, on saga type and so on and well the the problem is you end up with something you know insanely complicated which you um, it's, maybe it's very good and, and these parameters you get in terms of other you know molecular assumptions and so on but uh, but I've not seen anybody actually really using that in, in, in applications. And then there's a very interesting more recent model of Pevney, uh, Selinger and Slukin so now you have, uh, well, this is in the one, well, this is the one constant. Well, yeah, they have to have this because you're, I guess you're having curl n equals zero. Uh, um, and, and now you, you get b times this thing. And this is what gives you kind of oscillations in rho, which, which, um, which hopefully uh, predict, these, predict these layers. And this q is, I guess, very small. But the problem, I mean, the problem I have with all these things is that, you know, they're introducing a, a, a macroscopic variable that is varying on a molecular length scale. So at a minimum, you, you have to find some good reason for why that's a, a decent thing to do, right? So, and maybe, maybe it's okay, you, you're, you're minimizing, you're, you're averaging over some time interval or something, or, but um, it's, not, it's not clear to me and, and it's never sort of really discussed. Um, anyway, so th these are all these models. Okay, so now I want to come to um, what we've tried to do, we being uh, Giacomo Cannavari and Bianca Strofolini. Uh, to try and do something about this particular problem and see whether we could
prove anything. Uh, so it, it, it's, it, first of all, it's a free boundary problem because you've got air above there. Um, and, 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 and we're not able to, to deal with that, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, uh, so you'd like to be able to show that the minimum is attained and, and you'd like to be able to predict the whole three-dimensional picture like you saw in the, in the pictures. And one, one thing that would be very interesting to predict would be the, the thickness of these layers, so the distance from here to here. Right? And then, you, then you'd have a, you know, that would be really good horizontal period. Okay, so instead, we're going to work on a fixed domain. So we're going to imagine that the boundary conditions are given to us. This is our omega, so it's going to be um, x1 between minus L and L, and x2 is going to be between 0 and some h of, h of x1. h is going to be positive, smooth, e.g. as shown, or, or a rectangle. Um, uh, and um, we're going to consider... Um, for x in, in omega, so omega is going to be a two-dimensional domain, so we're going to do a two-dimensional theory. We're going to consider directive fields with the third component zero. So n is going to be uh, just depending on x1 and x2, and it's going to be in s1 now because it's the uh, because well because this has to be in s2. So, so n is a unit vector in 2D. Okay, and, and now, th in this case, the, the saddle display term vanishes in 2D. Okay. So that the ozone frank energy does reduce to this expression. Boundary conditions, uh, well, uh, on, the, on the L and minus L, we'll just assume it's periodic, which is not brilliant, but uh, okay. And then on, on the... On the, on the uh, Bottom surface, x2 equals 0, uh, n will be parallel to e1, so planar on the bottom surface, and, uh, and n is going to be parallel on, on the top surface to the, um, to, the, to the normal. So it's going to be homeotropic on the top surface. That's where, um, in the real problem, it's in contact with air. So, and we'll, we'll allow n to be non orientable, so we'll use the two-dimensional Q tensor, which is, well, the constant in front, you can make it what you like, but, um, but we do this for a certain reason. I'll explain, but anyway, 1 over root 2 times n tensor n minus a half the identity. So Q is symmetric, it's trace-free, and it belongs to this, to this set, of course, the, the set script n of um, such matrices for n in S1. And uh, the, the, the constant 1 over root 2 uh, means that the gradient of n squared is the same as the gradient of q squared. So that's why we do it. So that expresses the elastic energy in terms of q. And now, uh, what about the constant layer thickness business? So that's, um, so that's going to be, um, uh, should be curl n is 0. So you have to represent that in terms of Q, which is a little bit irritating. So you, it's this quadratic form. Okay, so this quadratic form is equal to curl of n squared if, if, uh, if, um, if Q is smooth. And, uh, and so, the, so the condition that A of Q gradient Q gradient Q is 0 expresses the constant layer thickness in terms of Q. So now we need a jump energy. So uh, we're going to have. Uh, so we're going to work in SPV two um, uh, with values in n. Okay, so that's the things in SPV two with values in two by two matrices uh, with Q of x in n, and we'll consider a, um, a phi now is going to depend on 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 a Q plus Q minus and the normal. Okay, and we want to choose it uh, so that it's a good model for the. Um, energy of a domain wall. Um, okay, so the conditions will be, um, well, we want it to be zero when q plus is q minus, so no, no jump, no, no energy, invariant to uh, changing the orientation of the normal, and then you have to swap q plus and q minus, of course. Uh, frame indifference, 
now it's uh, rotations in, 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 in R2. Um, and now, more interesting, penalization of dislocations. So um, we're, go we're going to suppose that for a given Q plus and Q minus, that this is minimized for a new satisfying this condition. So, um, so given, given Q plus and Q minus, there are four such new that bisect the angles between the corresponding, so Q plus is associated with a director N plus and Q minus with a uh, director N minus. Now, now, so I mean, if you have if you have two lots of layers, say horizontal here and in this direction here, in general they won't match up very well, right? But but this condition is is to allow you to have no dislocations in some sense, they, so they match up perfectly. Right? Um, so that's the that's the idea, uh, and um, here's a a singular jump energy satisfying these conditions. Uh, namely that uh, it's Q plus minus Q minus to the power alpha, alpha strictly between 0 and 1, if Q plus nu dot nu is Q minus nu dot nu, and is plus infinity otherwise. Okay, now, could we use that? Well, um, unfortunately not, uh, because it's not what is called BV elliptic. So, uh, uh, BV elliptic... BV ellipticity is, is sort of the analog of quasi-convexity in this in this theory, and and it's a condition that's that's essentially necessary for, in some extent, sufficient for proving the existence of minimizers. Uh, instead, you can consider um, the BV elliptic envelope of this as the largest BV elliptic function that is less than it. And now you see why I worked with two Italian collaborators, right? <laughs> because only, only, only Italians would be capable of doing this. And amazingly, they, they came up with the exact, exact uh, formula for the BV elliptic envelope of this, which is this expression. It's a Q plus minus Q minus to the alpha. This is not an easy calculation at all. Uh, times the square root of 1 plus root 2 times the, this difference over the difference of q plus minus q minus. That's if q plus is not equal to q minus, and if it's uh, equal to, to uh, q minus, then we take it to be 0. Right, so so they, they, they calculated that explicitly. And, um, and now you can uh, prove the existence of a minimizer, so that's, this is more or less standard once you've got, you know, the, the BV ellipticity, etc. Uh, so we have the uh, gradient of Q squared, and we have the energy here, and it attains a minimum satisfying this, this constraint. And um, the boundary conditions. Uh, and to now I say a bit more about the boundary conditions. So you have to be careful uh, in case j Q jumps at the boundary. So what you do is you thicken the boundary. So for example, on the boundary x2 equals 0, you require that q is equal to the given value, say for minus 1, less than x2, less than 0. So you extend things below, below the substrate. And, and that, allows, that allows you potentially to have a jump at the boundary itself. Okay. Uh, so
the simple solution. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, all right, so, um, so we'll, uh, to try and get some understanding of the minimizers, we'll consider a rectangular domain and configurations whose jump set is given in some sense. So, so um, it's going to be in polar coordinates, theta is going to go from zero to pi, and there's going to be a, 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 a row of theta. And, uh, and above, um, above the curve, this above the, so row of zero and row of pi is going to be L, okay? And, and you're going to have horizontal layers above the curves and concentric lower, and concentric circular layers below and neglect the elastic energy. So we neglect the elastic energy. So we just, we just, and we say that above some curve, which we express in terms of polar coordinates, the layers are going to be horizontal. And below, well, you see the vertical bits for the boundary data, uh, we're going to have these um, 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 uh, circular layers. And then it turns out that the unique minimizer is a parabola that bisects the symmetric layers. Exactly. Right. And now, now, now let's do something a little bit more realistic. So we take a domain which is a quarter disk and a jump set now which is going to be defined on that uh, uh, quarter well, for theta between 0 and, and, and uh, pi by 2. And now underneath, the, underneath we're going to have the layers horizontal and uh, uh, above they're going to be um, um, uh, um, uh, radial, radial um, uh, layers. Okay, and now we, now we, now we don't uh, neglect the elastic energy. And then it turns out that uh, the, the the minimizers very nearly. In fact, you know these are the the predicted ones and and and, 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 and simulated ones. And, and you really can't tell, you really can't tell the difference. So it it. Um, uh, so of course, as you as you move this, it will change the elastic energy. There's no elastic energy here, but there's elastic energy here due to the due to the bending. And as you move the curve, it will it will change the elastic energy, but but it will also change the length of the curve and the and the jumps and so on. So it turns out that and and this is a, a pretty much like what um, maybe we go back to the uh, pictures. It's, it's not so different from what you see over here, all right? So, um, so, so that, that's sort of quite uh, satisfactory in some sense. Uh, now, um, so that's more or less it, uh, except that um, uh, what we're we trying to do, well, we would, we would like to so, so one thing about that, uh, however marvelous it is to have calculated that beefy elliptic envelope, it, it has one sort of defect, which is that that the the minima uh, are are the same. The minima of the energy are the same for the two angle bisectors, and we 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 don't believe that that is that that's necess that should necessarily be the case. So we would like to try and construct such a, an energy uh, with different min minima at the two angle bisectors. Or well, study the free boundary problem, uh, we thought a little bit about this, and it's not, you know, you, you are worrying things like the, like the free boundary becoming vertical and stuff like this. It's kind of, it's kind of awkward, uh, and um, so we've not so far succeeded in doing anything. And we'd like to um, understand the relations between models based on the molecular density and our sharp interface model. So there's some numerical uh, computations of um, these people. The one I know is Pedro Farrell from Oxford. Um, so he's an expert in computing um, equilibria of com complicated problems. He's, he's, um, uh, he uses this so-called deflation method. I don't know if any of you, any of you know this. You, 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 first find some, you first find some minimum or critical point and then you modify the functional so that 
it somehow forces you away from that critical point, and then you find another one, and then you, and then you modify the functional again. It's, it's quite an interesting uh, numerical technique, and they and they used a, a, a modification of a model of myself and Bedford, which is in turn a, a sort of modification of the of this um, uh, these people which I which I showed you the functional. So that's it, actually. So thank you. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, that's right. The, the absolutely continuous part of the grid, yeah. No, that's right. So it can't have a it can't have a, a defect actually on the on the bottom, of course, in this because it's two dimensional it's two dimensional model. So um, so the, the so the thing that um, the thing that showed here that's not possible because it's got a it's got a defect here which would have infinite energy actually um, but we were ignoring the elastic yeah. energy in this case so <laughs> <laughs>